So to start off our fine, uh, our, again, our final, our third and final session, I'd first like to introduce Dr. Cindy Connolly, Rosemary B. Greco Endowed Term Chair for Advocacy and Professor of Nursing at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. Dr. Connolly will be presenting a case study of unintended consequences, children and candy aspirin in 20th century America. Thank you so much, and I'm thrilled to be here. I want to thank Brandon and everyone in FDA for inviting me. Uh, unlike my colleagues who have presented thus far today who have talked about the present and the future, I'm actually going to be talking about the past. So um, I was asked to, uh, to sort of give some overview of sort of how we've tried to make drugs palatable for children in the past, and as Dr. Michelle said this morning, that has always been um, important. From the 19th century, uh, soothing syrups that led, that helped create the FDA through the elixir sulfonilamide scandal in the 1930s to many other attempts. And of course, it's very laudable um, uh, for all of us. I don't think anyone likes to take medications that, um, that don't taste Good. But most of us who are adults have the wherewithal to understand um, why it is that we're taking those um, drugs. But kids, of course, don't. And um, while I'm coming to you today as someone who studied history at the doctoral level, I've also been a pediatric nurse for more than four decades. And so I'm one of those people, I think it was Dr. Myers this morning, who was talking about frustrated nurses with um, trying to get small children to take prednisolone that was coming out of their mouth. I was one of the, I'm one of those people who would be calling her um, in frustration. I've probably spent thousands of hours trying to get children to take medication over the course of the past 40 years. Um, in my book, I, I go through a series of cases where I talk about the legislative and political and social history of, of medications for kids through the, throughout the 20th century both prescription and non-prescription, and nest it into what we know about the history of children's health care, pediatrics, um, the, and the changing ideas about childhood and parenting in the United States. I also, um, um, so, and taste has always been, um, let me just make sure I can. What am I doing? So, Taste has always been important. This is a slide that um, is the cover of my book that Eli Lilly generously let me use for the cover of my book. This was from their 1953 Juvenile Board of Medication Taste Testers. My guess is that this one did not make, um, make a pass, like half, but it was let the kids decide for themselves what, me, what flavor of medication they want to take. Um, for my book, I was able to conduct uh, lots of oral histories and travel to archives all around the United States to look at materials um, to sort of generate this narrative. I was particularly fortunate to have funding from the National, uh, from the uh, NEH, as well as a generous grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, as well as a few others. And I want to particularly thank the FDA History Office here and especially John Swan because they helped connect me with materials that I didn't know existed and also really helped me um, understand them and un unpack some of what, what it was that I was seeing. So the chapter I'm talking about here today uses children's aspirin as a case study to look at 20th century over the drug market for children. It's a rise and fall story that shows some of the unintended consequences um, um, what, what, and what can happen when you have a weak regulatory apparatus to address them. So in 1948, pharmaceutical entrepreneur Abe Plow of Plow Pharmaceuticals successfully reformulated a long off-patent product, aspirin, into a flavored small-dose chewable tablet designed to children's palate. And I'm thinking he probably used uh, um, rudiments of some of the techniques I heard some of you talk about this morning and so mu learned so much from. So Plow had purchased St. Joseph's aspirin back in 1921, but no matter what he did, he was unable to make it profitable. But just after World War II ended in 1945, he noticed the explosion of births 
and set his chemists to work, and the new orange-flavored, orange-colored, sweet-flavored St. Joseph's um, aspirin debuted in September of 1947. Um, Plow had hit the zeitgeist perfectly. It was a, a, you know, there was an explosion of births in the early post-war era. The numbers of, of, of baby food companies, for example, increased fivefold in the first five years after the war. The first three years after the war, um, the uh, the numbers of uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the numbers of of uh, commercial baby food products um, increased. The numbers the numbers of toy companies quadrupled the numbers of, of um, other uh, mass-produced children's furniture increased. And so in line with these new products, there was now um, an antipyretic tablet formulated first for, for children. This was, while he advertised it in 1947, 1948, this is his first big ad campaign. I scoured all kinds of um, uh, periodicals for um, in the popular press for this era, and this is his first big one. And um, so like, of course, all advertisements in this era, it's presenting this very gendered, um, middle-class, white um, uh, family um, marketed for that population. And it's trying to convince parents that children have specific and unique e uh, needs through this sort of the, that gown doesn't fit, honey, or those trousers don't, don't fit. Um, and St. Joseph's ad, so this was the first one. Unlike most of the other ones in magazines at this time, this is in color. It's much more sophisticated, and it's in every single um, issue. So he's really spending um, a fortune on this. There are also, at the same time, there are also, uh, I don't know if they're, these are real testimonials or not that were written to Plow, but there are also um, uh, letters purported to be from, from mothers, and then also importantly um, from uh, physicians endorsing the product as well. And so within a short period of time, this St. Joseph's candy aspirin, as it's often called, is the blockbuster number one drug used in children, even far outstripping penicillin, which, um, and that was really the heyday of when we were using penicillin for virtually everything. Until the 1980s and the warning of aspirin's link to Rye syndrome, it could be found at the bedside of millions of sick children. So here's my, I guess, disclosure for this. Um, I couldn't find a copyright-free picture of a child with aspirin at his bedside. This is my brother in 1968, and I took that picture. Um, I, w I was then, I guess, eight years old, and I don't know why I thought that would be such a fun picture um, uh, to take. But um, so that's the only picture I've been able to find of a child with uh, aspirin at his, at his bedside. And my brother is actually somewhere on the Zoom because he wanted, he thinks very, very excited to see himself um, out in the world in this, this picture. So, um, so in the wake of success of St. Joseph's, um, Bayer also rushes to introduce their own pediatric formulation. And they're directly advertising it as tastes like your children's favorite candy. Other companies would follow, but nobody could compete with. Plow. By 1955, they own 81% of the market. It's so it's bringing such big business to his company that he's being uh, that you know it's being promoted as a big business built for little customers. Um, Plow's of, of, sorry shares of his of his company, his profits are going through the roof throughout the 1950s. But there's an unintended consequence to this candy. Aspirin, which some of you in the, um, in the room and on the Zoom call probably know about. Within a few years, the incidence of aspirin poisoning in young children increased dramatically. Before World War II, only about 20% of the annual fatalities from aspirin in the United States occurred in children under the age of, of uh, three. Um, if you've ever tasted aspirin, that's, that's not going to surprise. You. But by 1951, this group accounted for 80% of the deaths from aspirin. In the seven years alone between 1947 and 1954, the American Academy of Pediatrics estimated the incidence of aspirin poisoning in young children had increased by 500%. The FDA, public health activists, pediatricians, and pharmacists start raising the alarm very quickly um, in the new anti-poisoning campaigns for newly created poison control centers, and aspirin is prominently featured in those. I think this one is from 1954. Um, 
And uh, so the, uh, and again, all these same groups begin to approach the aspirin industry alone and together um, in the early 1950s with concerns, with data con um, concerning aspirin overingestion in young children and poisoning. And in the book, I go into great detail about a lot of the back and forth. I'm just going to give an overview here. Despite the mounting evidence, the aspirin industry, because of most likely the huge profits involved, denied that there was any safety problem with children's aspirin. In a letter to the American Academy of Pediatrics, which was copied to the FDA where I first found it, a plow executive challenged the data documenting that there was any problem at all, saying that they'd sold 35 million packages of St. Joseph's aspirin and they had no documented incidences where there was a problem at all. Um, with additional prodding in 1955 about the problem from the AMA's powerful Council on Pharmacy and Chemistry, the FDA convened a hearing. The agency asked aspirin company attendees to consider a number of recommendations, such as putting uh, such a safety package, packaging and to undertake dosage standardization across companies, the lack of which, people argued, uh, meant that some parents accidentally overdosed their own children. The outcome of the hearing was only that, asked, uh, that the industry would consider standardizing dosing and creating warning levels for parents. They rejected out of hand the idea of safety packaging. Duke University pediatrician Jay Arena, who had a strong interest in pediatric poisoning and was an early leader in the field, was so disgusted with the lack of an outcome from the hearing, he picked up his phone and called Abe Plow himself. Gave, after giving, an, giving him an impassioned description of the course of the candy aspirin poison child he had just treated, he appealed to Plow's marketing sensibility that it would be a major public relations coup if the company figured out a way to prevent young children from opening the bottle. Uh, Plow agreed, and so even as Plow formally is fighting the idea of uh, regulations, behind the scenes they're working to create that first safety cap which when it comes out, and this is the first ad that I can find that's being advertised in um, anywhere, that's being advertised in parents, and clearly they're talking about the, you know, the safety advantage um, of it. And pretty soon, Bayer and all the other aspirin companies followed. But unfortunately, the incidence of aspirin poisoning continues to rise. By the 1950s, 20% of all cho poisoning in children comes from children's aspirin. Again, sales continued to go through the roof, and calls in the early 1960s to do something about the problem go by the wayside um, in the wake of thalidomide and efforts to forge major, uh, uh, major new FDA law regulating prescription drug safety and efficacy. By the way, it wasn't just parents um, who, were, uh, who loved the product. It was health professionals as well, and you can see that in the venerable um, uh, and the venerable uh, you know, baby and well child care by Dr. Spock. Um, epic, uh, see, the first, uh, the early editions do not mention children's um, aspirin, but his later 1957 edition below um, does talk about the importance of, of, of children's uh, aspirin for, uh, for pain and for fever in children. Um, finally, in 1965, in response to an aspirin overdose of one of his staffers, and in, um, and, in, uh, and in a neighbor, South Dakota Senator uh, George McGovern in introduces his own aspirin legislation in terms of safety packaging to minimize morbidity and mortality, the Children's Aspirin Amendment of 1965. The bill is considered, along with a number of others related to child safety, under the umbrella of the Child Protection Act of 1966. Um, the aspirin industry plans to ignore them. Um, they talk in so the trade journals um, say, but they very quickly had to pivot when uh, President Johnson um, issued a statement, not just his strong support for the proposed statute, but he calls out the, um, uh, you know, the, the need to limit a for li li limit aspirin, children's aspirin available in retail packages. Industry is absolutely stunned. They call a quick. Um, they have a quick meeting, and they decide that this is going to be their line in the sand, that if they don't do something that the regulatory, um, sort of the, the, the regulatory power that um, has hampered, they say, their prescription, um, that their colleagues who develop prescription drugs is going to come for them. They call it their rendezvous with 
destiny. Um, uh, debates surrounding the need for more federal oversight and packaging, labeling, marketing, marketing of children's aspirin become the focal point of five days of riveting testimony and interchange that spans from June to September of 1966. I'm going to spend a minute on this because it shows really the high watermark of, of industry strategy. First, there's the FDA's crusading new commissioner. He's the first to testify. He presents all kinds of data on escalating morbidity and mortality in children from aspirin. He's got a wealth of evidence. He says every three days in the United States, a child dies from an overdose of children's aspirin. Congressman seemed uh, riveted by his testimony and ready to act until the aspirin industry, supported by the glass and packaging manufacturers that, were, that would be impacted by any kind of mandatory safety closures, changing in packaging, changes in, um, uh, in sort of the way in which the drug was sold, testified. And, um, and basically, they, th this was their, uh, their response, that um, uh, I'm distilling it for you here. They, they continue to say that there's absolutely no problem with aspirin um, poisoning. It doesn't happen. But if it does, which they don't concede, it's bad parenting um, or children who are psychologically um, disturbed. And that regulation will harm children's interests and American business and is unpatriotic. Um, so if the, um, the bill gets, they do such a good job that the aspirin amendment is tossed from, from the Child Protection Act. There's a call for another FDA hearing. It takes a few more years um, for stakeholders to finally get a Poison Prevention Packaging Act that covers medications in 1970. Aspirin's the first product covered by the new law, and between 1971 and 1976, aspirin mortality rates in children in the U.S. declined by 50 percent, according to the Public Health Service. So first of all, why does any of this uh, matter to people who aren't historians, which I'm assuming is most of all of you? I want to acknowledge that there aren't any lessons that we can easily map onto today's concerns. Today's concerns. History doesn't work that way, but it can help us understand unintended consequences and offer clues to avoid making some of the same mistakes. I don't think any um, any one intended for um, for this to uh, to happen, but the money just got so big it was very difficult to think about how to rein it in in ways that were not going to hurt um, business. Um, I think it's worth remembering for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's so quickly forgotten. So but I think this is uh, 1977, the American Journal of Public Health publishes an article that talks about the use of, of safety closures is a model for air, other areas of accident prevention because it's a model public-private partnership. And really a deep dive into the data shows that that's not the case, that it really took a lot of effort on a lot of different people to, um, to bring industry um, uh, to, the, to the table. It's also worth remembering, because we were asked to think about, in preparation for this workshop, right, some questions. And again, I'm thinking of this in a historical case study. So is there data available to suggest that candy-like features accelerate a, tent, a trend toward their use? So absolutely, um, thinking about uh, sort of children's aspirin, low dose children, what we now call low dose aspirin um, in the 20th century, before we had that, um, it was a drug not widely used in children at all. M sponging, medicated baths, or what was primarily used for fever. You see that in pediatric medical and nursing textbooks until the late 1950s. Um, after its introduction, aspirin becomes even more popular than penicillin and the most widely used drug in, um, in children. So the answer to that is yes. Um, do adults perceive more palatable medications safer? Yes. The, the colorful ads and candy advertising leads pediatricians um, to begin to suggest in their writing in the 1950s and 1960s that parents believe that, uh, that, 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 uh, this, this, that these drugs are, 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 are safer than, say, for example, a colorful cleaning product, which they know is not is, is poisonous. But these drugs, um, because they look and are marketed like candy, seem, seem like they might be different. And was the candy dosage to form, um, to, uh, is there evidence, evidence that it shapes consumer behavior? In this instance, again, ab absolutely. 
this product was not profitable. It became really the anchor of a major pharmaceutical firm's um, product line, and um, and sort of it is it, it is etched into baby boomer consciousness. Actually, you can find if you go online to YouTube um, the character who played the uh, Ken Osmond who played little uh, Eddie Haskell on uh, the TV show Leave It to Beaver in 2012 did a low-dose aspirin remarketed um, to older baby boomers. Remember the drug that you loved as a child? It's, you can now take it again. It's good for, your, um, for your, your heart. And finally, you know, this is a little harder one to answer, right? It was ubiquitous in homes. Was it to blame? Um, I think it was, it was ubiquitous in homes. It certainly tasted um, good. It was widely advertised, and its uh, undoubtable appeal to children certainly all contributed to its increase in usage. So the, the you know the challenge is how to rec reconcile, as we've all talked about today, right issues surrounding child protection with innovation that benefits them and other people who can't swallow pills, and to know that there's always going to be those unintended consequences, and for enormously profitable profitable products. It's, it's naive to expect that industries are going to be able to police and monitor themselves. For decades, the FDA, pediatricians, public health and consumer activists, and even Congress were no match for the power of the aspirin industry. So I think an important lesson of this case study is that it needs to be baked into this, a sturdy reg regulatory apparatus so that there will be tools to address those unintended consequences even if we don't know what they are right now. So thank you very much for taking, let, listening to me take you back to the past. Thank you once again, Dr. Connolly. Uh, so uh, for our next presentation, I have the pleasure of introducing two speakers joining us from the CDC, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, First, we have Captain Jennifer Lind, uh, epidemiologist and captain in the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. Captain Lind serves as the Partnerships and Prevention Lead in the Medication Safety Program in the Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion at CDC. Joining us virtually, we also have Ms. Mary Beth Civilis, Lead Epidemiologist in CDC's Medication Safety Program in the Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion, and the title of their talk is Preventing Pediatric Medication Overdose, Strategies, Challenges, and Innovations. Thank you, Brandon. And you've placed us well after Dr. Connolly. I think we are a good follow-up as we talk about pediatric medication safety, the history of it, but then also some of the strategies, challenges, and innovations that we're using to try and address some of the issues. So in the medication safety program, we work to protect patients and members of the community by leading uh, CDC surveillance activities for national tracking of adverse drug events and other drug-related harms and translating data into targeted prevention actions through collaboration and communication. So how do we do adverse drug event surveillance? Pretty much the old-fashioned way. So for the adverse drug event study, it's called the NICE case, or which stands for National Electronic Injury Surveillance System, Cooperative Adverse Drug Event Surveillance Project. It's a mouthful, but it is a collaboration between CDC, FDA, and the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission. And for NICE case, what we do is it's an active population-based surveillance system. Currently, it's based on a national probability sample of approximately 80 hospitals. And the stratum um, has, includes one children's hospital and it's stratified by size. And then the data are weighted so that they can generate national estimates of ED visits and subsequent hospitalizations of um, adverse drug events. So this is our case definition for nice cades. An adverse drug event is an injury or harm um, from the use of a drug, the injury is the ED visit, often precipitated by an action of manifestations. Attribution to the drug is based on clinician diagnosis or pathognomonic drug system um, symptom combination. And then prior to 2016, only adverse drug events resulting from therapeutic drug use were included, but then um, after 2016, the system was expanded to include adverse drug events following the use of, uh, for any intent, and that's shown in the box to the right. 
And then drugs include prescription or over-the-counter medications, supplements, and homeopathic products and vaccines. And so if you take a look at this chart here, it's from an analysis that was published just after we began doing adverse drug event surveillance using the NICE case data. Here you can see the population rates of emergency department visits for adverse drug events by age group. And so as you might expect, we saw that uh, there was increasing rates by age, but something we did not expect to see was that the rate for the youngest age group was actually um, similar to those of the older adults, which was something we weren't expecting. And so when we looked at these data a little bit more closely, we found that most of the ED visits in the youngest children were from unintentional medication overdoses. And so in the early 2000s, we saw that the number of young children being brought to emergency departments for unintentional medication overdoses and exposures was rising rapidly. And it increased by about 40% from 2004 to 2010. To put these numbers in perspective, a child born in 2007 had approximately a 1 in 54 chance of being brought to an emergency department for an accidental medication overdose or exposure by the age of six. And so that's where PROTECT comes into um, to play. And so in 2008, we actually convened a group of individuals working in these, this area, and we created the Prevention of Overdoses and Treatment Errors in Children Task Force Initiative, otherwise known as the PROTECT Initiative. PROTECT is a CDC-led public-private partnership that uses a collaborative, data-driven approach to reduce the harms from unintentional medication overdoses in young children. Partners include public health agencies, private sector companies, healthcare professional organizations, consumer patient advocates, standards organizations, and academic experts. And for the PROTECT initiative, we actually use a three-pronged approach. So first, we not only focus on improving safety packaging to reduce unsupervised ingestions, we also work on standardizing the labeling to reduce medication errors, and then also updating educational messages on safe use and storage. And so how can we prevent adverse drug events among young children? So as mentioned earlier, most of the emergency department visits for adverse drug events in young children were for unsupervised exposures. And despite the requirement for child-resistant packaging for most medications in the U.S., around the time of the PROTECT activities when they began, there were still over 60,000 ED visits annually for unsupervised exposures by children under the age of six. We know that child-resistant resistant packaging works when used appropriately, and this is a technology that has not actually changed much since the 1970s that we heard in Dr. Conley's um, presentation um, when it was first implemented. And so PROTECT partners have begun exploring how to create safety packaging that might be improved. We began by focusing on prevention of oral liquid OTC medication exposures. PROTECT partners came up with the idea of using a bottle adapter as a flow restrictor, to act as a secondary barrier that would always be in place to limit the amount of medication that young children could access on their own. They, use, um, they are designed to be used together with child-resistant caps. And then here you can see an announcement from Johnson & Johnson in 2011 stating that flow restrictors would voluntarily be added to pediatric acetaminophen products and other manufacturer, um, manufacturers of pediatric acetaminophen made similar commitments at that time. Since flow restrictors were introduced, we've tested them and, um, with young children, and they've actually proven to be effective. And so studies using poison center and emergency department data have found that they are both effective, or they are also effective in reducing the number of exposures overall and the number involving potentially toxic amounts of acetaminophen. An American Society for Testing and Material Standard Test Method was developed to assess flow restrictors use mechanical test for mechanical testing, and then FDA also released a draft guidance in 2020 that recommended broader use of restricted delivery systems, such as flow restrictors, to help further reduce the risk of unintended oral liquid drug ingestion. And so preventing ingestions of solid medications is actually a little bit more challenging. So as you would expect with liquid medications, they stay in the original bottle, typically, that they come in until it's time for use. On the other hand, solid dose medications are sometimes removed from the child-resistant packaging intentionally or unintentionally um, prior to use. And so what we wanted to know was um, what were the containers that most young children were accessing for solid medications and whether it might differ uh, by medication class. And so what we did was we partnered with five poison centers to ask additional questions when they received calls about an exposure to an oral liquid medication. 
um, by a child age five or younger. And for most of the prescription medications, many of which can cause toxicity in small amounts, in at least half of these calls to poison centers, the child access the pills that were not in the original container, and that's signified by the blue bars, and that were intentionally transferred to a non-child resistant container, or that were intentionally transferred to a non-child resistant container, which is uh, signified by the green bars shown here in the figure. And so it was clear that we also need to address these exposures in adults where they're removing them for, um, from the medication from the original container prior to the child accessing them. And so this is one um, unfortunate real example of how one pill can kill that was recently featured in one of CDC's Safe Healthcare blogs. In the blog, our Protect partner, Adam and Mary Beth Gillen, actually shared the tragic story of how their nine-month-old daughter, Macy, died um, after ingesting a single methadone pill that was found on a neighbor's house on the floor. And the perspective that the patient and family representatives offer when they share their personal experiences highlights critical pieces of patient safety that we may not always see in our data. So through PROTECT, we are actually continuing to encourage innovations in packaging, both of the primary containers, which is the packaging that the medication comes in when you receive it from a pharmacy or a store, but then also the secondary containers, which are the containers that adult might transfer medications to intentionally. And so the top two images that you'll see show interventions for primary packaging, so different types of flow restrictors for liquid medications, and then also unit dose packaging. And then the bottom image actually shows the design of a locking pill organizer that's on the market, but please note we do not, to our knowledge, believe that it has been tested for child resistance yet. However, several companies that are members of the PROTECT initiative are actually working for, on different types of child deterrent uh, or locking pill organizers, and we expect some to come to market soon. And so as previously mentioned, emergency department visits for adverse drug events are relatively common in children less than five, and the vast majority of them are for unsupervised ingestions. However, there is a small portion, and that's signified here in red, of emergency department visits that are due to medication errors. And so these errors are more common among the smallest, most vulnerable children, children less than one year of age. I won't read through um, all of the different examples, but this ta uh, table actually illustrates how administration mix-ups can lead to a multifold medication overdoses and underdosing errors. And so I want to note also that when multiple different units are used, such as milliliters, teaspoons, tablespoons, and other units, it can be confused and these mix-ups can cause overdosing or underdosing. And so one of the things we focus on through PROTECT is that clearly and consistently showing milliliters only on liquid um, medication packaging labels and dosing devices can actually minimize errors when measuring and giving doses. And so PROTECT partners have initiated and led a number of activities focused on improving labeling of medication bottles and dosing devices and have participated in related activities by partner organizations. So through PROTECT, partners have encouraged not only education of prescribers, to increase the use of milliliter only on prescribing and dispensing oral liquid medications, but then also education of parents and caregivers to use a dosing device that comes with the child's medicine and to make sure that they get the right amount. We also have worked with Protect Partners to encourage production of milliliter only dosing devices to minimize errors when measuring and giving doses. And then shown here um, is an example of how we've worked with Protect Partners in terms of encouraging adoption of these recommendations. So in this particular example, a large retailer revised their standard operating procedures for oral liquid medication dispensing to promote safe dosing best practices. And so what they do with all of their oral liquid medications is they dispense a flow restrictor, a milliliter only syringe that is an appropriate size for the prescribed volume, and then they also have packaging that has messaging to encourage parents to keep medications up and away and out of sight and reach of young children. And we hope to begin partnering with other retailers in the coming years to encourage this practice. And so then lastly, the third prong in our three-pronged approach for PROTECT is focused on safe storage education. Back in December of 2011, we launched the Up and Away and Out of Sight educational program to update and disseminate educational messages nationally. 
In addition to the tools and resources and materials available online at upandaway.org, we also have rallies throughout the year um, to extend the reach of our messages about safe medication use and storage in a variety of media channels. We have print and online articles, social media, advertisement, radio, and video. We also encourage our Protect partners to help us reach broader audiences by participating in the rallies. And then this is an example of some of our core up and away messaging, which has historically been centered around very simple data-driven actions that parents and caregivers can take to prevent medication overdoses in children. I won't read through all of them, but, you know, it really shows that, you know, telling parents, again, keep your child safe, keep medications up and away and out of sight. And so some of this advertising looks very similar to what Dr. Conley um, showed in her um, presentation. And so the question is, with all of the interventions mentioned, have we seen any improvements in emergency department visits among young children? And so I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Mary Beth, who's on the phone to discuss some of the recent trends. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Lind, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to start by sharing some recent data from NICE-CADES, the NICE-CADES surveillance system um, that Dr. Lind introduced earlier. So in recent years, uh, we have seen overall declines in national estimates of emergency department or ED visits for unsupervised medication exposures by children aged five or younger. So from approximately 76,000 ED visits in 2010 to about 36,000 visits in 2020. The next slide. Uh, when we looked at trends in ED visits for unsupervised medication exposures by medication class, uh, we found declines in estimated visits for many classes from the period of 2009 to 2012 to 2017 to 2020. Um, and this table shows trends in estimates of ED visits for um, pediatric medication exposures to solid dosage form medications. And so the green arrows on the right indicate classes for which there were significant declines. And the red arrow indicates a class for which there was a significant increase during the period, and that corresponds to herbal products and alternative remedies. And so when we look more closely at the medications within this class, um, on the next slide, uh, we found that the increase was driven by a substantial increase in ED visits for melatonin exposures, uh, an increase of about 400% from 2009 to 2020. On the next slide. And so we looked more closely um, at these ED visits for unsupervised melatonin exposures by young children. And we compared them to visits for um, unsupervised exposures that involved other medications. And then on the next slide, you can see we found that the ED visits for unsupervised melatonin exposures involved slightly older children than the visits for exposures to other medications. So over half or 53.5% of visits for melatonin exposures involve children ages three to five years, uh, whereas only 25.9% of the visits um, involving other medications involve that age group. So um, nearly three quarters of the visits involving exposures to other medications were made by children age two or younger. And so that includes the developmental stages when children are gradually increasing their mobility, they're learning about their environment by putting things into their mouths. Um, but as children get older, we know that they become more selective, or at least you know, relatively so, about what they put into their mouths. And they may seek things that interest them. And so um, in our surveillance activities, we see narratives indicating that children in this age group or the, the somewhat older toddlers, um, they sometimes climb to reach medications. Sometimes they even move. Um, a chair or stools to help them access the medications. I think we saw um, some uh, some graphics of that from the earlier from um, Dr. Connolly's presentation. Um, and sometimes we see narratives too um, in which multiple children are involved. And so maybe a slightly older toddler opens the you know gets into the medication and and, and shares it with their siblings. We also found that about 46% of the visits involve female children, both for the melatonin exposures and the exposures that involve other medications. So there, there really was not any difference there by sex. Um, and an estimated 94% of ED visits for unsupervised melatonin exposures, the child did not require subsequent hospitalization, but for visits involving exposures to other medications, approximately 81% did not require hospitalization. And so the visits for the unsupervised melatonin exposures appear to be less serious. 
um, for ED visits involving exposures to melatonin and also for those involving exposures to other medications, about 87% involved only access to a single medication. And so that means that for 87% of the visits um, of melatonin exposures, the child only accessed melatonin and no other medications or, or supplements. We're currently working on an analysis to identify circumstances from case narratives that might help with targeting interventions. So for instance, although we know that most of the melatonin exposures involve solid dosage forms of the products, um, we're working to characterize the specific dosage form that was accessed. So for instance, what percent of the exposures involve gummies? That's something that we're, that we're currently working on. Okay, next slide. We know that many medications might look like candy. Um, so again, this is a timely reminder with Halloween being tomorrow. I know that my kids are, are very excited about that. Um, you can see some examples of common lookalikes in the image here on the right, which we use as part of our Up and Away education campaign that focuses on safe medication use and storage. Um, and distinguishing the medications from the candy can be very difficult, even for adults. Um, and so this graphic is a reminder to parents and other caregivers of young children that if they can't tell the difference, the children probably also can't tell the difference. So it's important to keep all medications in a place that young children cannot reach or see. And the next slide. So after finding this increase in ED visits for unsupervised melatonin exposures, we have updated our safe storage messaging for the Up and Away campaign to, speci to specifically include gummies. And so this message now reads, keep medicines, vitamins, and other supplements, including gummies, in a safe place that young kids can't see or reach. And the next slide. Uh, we plan to continue monitoring trends in these ED visits. Um, Healthy People 2030, it's an initiative of the US Department of Health and Human Services, and it's a national 10-year plan for addressing the most critical public health priorities. The next slide. Uh, one of the Healthy People 2030 objectives is to reduce emergency department visits for medication overdoses in young children. And so the baseline measurement for Healthy People 2030 is 25.6 estimated ED visits for 10,000 children under five years old in 2016 and 2017. And on the next slide, um, the target rate to be achieved within the decade is 16.6 ED visits per 10,000 children under five years of age. And so that amounts to an additional 35% reduction by 2026, 2027. Some of the data that we presented earlier um, suggests that we're making progress in achieving the target, um, but it, it will be important to continue to monitor trends in ED visits for unsupervised medication exposures um, so that we can target uh, the prevention efforts based on the latest available data. And that is all I have for you today. So thank you very much. Thank you both again for that presentation. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Christopher Hoyt, Medical Director of the Rocky Mountain Poison Center and the Fellowship Director of the Medical Toxicology Fellowship Program at the Rocky Mountain Poison and Drug Center. Dr. Hoyt is also Professor of Emergency Medicine, Medical Toxicology and Pharmacology at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. And today he'll be giving um, some information regarding poison control guidelines, and the title of his, his presentation is, When Drugs Look Like Candy, What Role Do Poison Centers Play? <clears throat> Thanks very much, uh, Brandon. I have to say, actually, Brandon, uh, we, we, we talked about um, coming on and doing this lecture series. And I will tell you that um, I was this close, Brandon, wearing my Halloween costume. Remember, I asked you if I could wear one. My nine-year-old daughter really wanted me to come on and do that, but I'm glad I didn't because nobody else has her on. I didn't want to embarrass myself. So glad I didn't do that. Thanks for the invitation. I'm going to come talk about poison centers, as Brandon just mentioned. Um, and one of the things is, you know, we all recognize the role uh, that over-the-counter medications play in our society. Very important. Um, however, one of the things that really kind of disturbs me, um, and Dr. Doyon sitting in the front row can attest we sort of do the same thing professionally, um, is that it seems like there's this um, – sort of thought that, oh, because kids are really small and young, there's no way they would take enough of a medication for them to get sick, which is just 
patently not true. Um, and this, this is sort of a case of this. So um, there's a two-year-old boy that came into an emergency department um, who, in, a, in one of the hospitals that, which my poison center covers, uh, came in really sleepy. Um, and at first there was no sort of like, why is this kid so sleepy? Um, parents didn't fess up at first what happened. Uh, but the kid was, you see the vital signs here. These are all very normal uh, vital signs for a two-year-old boy. Um, but the mother then sort of later on fessed up that she found the uh, boy um, sort of really sleeping near a bottle that was open where there was a, a certain gummy formulation of a medication that was found on the ground. Child was sleepy, uh, really minimally responsive. Um, everything else sort of neurologically was intact. But the issue with this particular case was uh, that the care providers that we were dealing with with this case did not feel as though a kid that's under the age of five could take enough of a drug that would make them this sleepy. So they did what's called NAT or non-accidental trauma workup in the kid because they thought that this must be a trauma because there's no way that it could be a drug. Kid is too small uh, to take enough medications to get sick. And so they subjected this child to CAT scans. They subjected this child to a lumbar puncture thinking, well, maybe this is meningitis. They subjected this child to all these things when really the culprit was sitting right in front of them. And we just need to change the attitude that kids that are under five years old who take drugs can definitely get ill. And there are lots of times there are bad outcome. Like Dr. Lynn said, the methadone case, um, as that, you know, opioids are, you know, notorious for that and how important it is to lock those up. But kids under five can get sick. So what are we going to talk about? I'm going to introduce you to poison centers and the role that we can help play in doing surveillance to keep um, – kids and everybody else really safe from these over-the-counter medications. Um, obviously, they're, again, they're very important in society, uh, but we want to keep people safe. We're going to talk about some poison center data and go through that, um, talk about trends and some trends that we see. And age is more than just a number. Um, I think Dr. Lynn maybe uh, just sort of uh, went through talking about, like, why would a young kid want to get into these medications? Why would a kid that's maybe a little bit older want to do it? Why do young adults do it? Um, and so we're going to talk about that, and then we're going to talk about how sort of poison centers um, come to creating guidelines and how we can be helpful in doing surveillance and also with the care that we deliver uh, for poison patients. So poison centers, uh, we practice toxicology, um, and we are uh, public health institutions. We are, are, are really our mandates are to prevent and mitigate poisoning injury. We do that through a lot of different ways, clinical care, education, research, many ways, but sort of preventing and mitigating poisoning injury is at the core of what we do. The first poison center was established in, in 1953, and it was really focused on household um, ingestions in little kids. That's sort of the genesis for a lot of where poison centers started from. 1958, America's Poison Centers, it was actually called um, the Association, the American Association for Poison Control Centers before, recently changed the name. It is now America's Poison Centers. It was founded in the 50s. Um, and then there was a rapid increase in the number of PCs, all, all the way over 400 uh, by the time the 1970s came along. And then in the 80s and 90s, we recognized we didn't need that many centers, so we consolidated a lot of them um, so that we could become more efficient and provide 24-7 um, service. So in 2002, we now have 1-800-222-1222, which is the number that you can call from anywhere in the United States, and you will get the corresponding poison center um, to, the, to where you're – well, actually, it's really to the zip code that you're calling from. We're changing that, but you will get the corresponding poison center that you should. And currently, we have 55 poison centers in the U.S. Embarrassingly, but this was really high technology at the time, um, this is how our agents who were taking these calls – um, this is how they answered these calls. So if you had someone who, um, you know, called, this is, a, this is an acetaminophen card. Um, you called about acetaminophen, they could go grab a card and it had information about acetaminophen on it. So um, this is how we used to answer calls from a public uh, with our agents answering the phone. Um, we branded Mr. Yuck. Uh, I think very, um, it's very apt and it's a good a good, um, it's a good sort of representation of you know, beware um, and who you can call if you get in trouble. Um, and then we changed it, got a little bit more modernized. The, the AAPCC logo um, came about, and now we have this logo, which is America's Poison Centers. Um, so that's sort of how the branding has gone throughout the years. 
And now we've become much more technologically savvy. So instead of using those cards, you can actually go to a, a product database. There's always been new products added to this database where our agents will answer calls and they can look them up quickly um, on their digital database to give you the most um, accurate information on whatever you're calling about. Here's a representation of 55 poison centers. All the states are covered. Some of the states, as you can see, have multiple poison centers in the same states, really based on um, your uh, population of your state. And then you can also see that some states um, cover multiple states for efficiency states. So, for example, um, this is Colorado, where I'm from. We cover multiple other states, like Montana we cover. We cover the state of Nevada. We cover Hawaii. So we'll cover some other states really for efficiency sake. But the reason why it's important that we have all these poison centers, I get that question a lot, like, why are there so many poison centers? Why don't you just have one national poison center? Well, there are regional variations in what we actually see as poison centers, and some poison centers see environmental toxins that other ones do not see, which is why it's important that we have um, different poison centers so that people can get the best care um, that they can and when they call us. So poison centers, 24-7 service, 365, is staffed by specialists in poisoning information called spies. I have a lot of jokes about that, but I won't give them here now because I don't have enough time to follow them through. Um, we are governed by best practice call center and infrastructure with KPIs or key performance indicators, so we follow best practice call center um, guidelines. Um, and, but at our core, what we do is we provide medical management for poisonings and exposures. Here you can see a list of, um, you know, some caller types. We get all sorts of caller types, but this is a, a pretty common list of the people who call us. Um, here's our staffing. So, um, you know, we have these spies, our agents that answer the phone. Usually there are nurses or there are farm Ds who are doing that. My center has 29 um, spies currently. 77% of them are certified, which is the C spy, which is an exam you take um, after you've been doing this for a while um, in order to be, quote, certified. 77%, we have some new spies that um, started recently with us. It takes a while for you to, you have to sit for uh, a period of time and then there's an examination that you have to take. Some poison centers have PIPs, which are poison information providers that take lower acuity calls. Um, they're really paraprofessionals, and so most of the clinical stuff goes through our spies. Um, and then there's backup support. So we have, at uh, all poison centers, there's backup support. There's medical toxicologists who are physicians who uh, do some backup. My program has a fellowship program, so we have um, doctors who are training to become uh, medical toxicologists that also do some of the backup, and they're all board-certified medical toxicologists. And then we have clinical toxicologists. My partner, um, who um, helps operate uh, Rocky Mountain Poison Center, um, Shereen Banerjee, um, she's a PharmD. She um, is the managing director of our, our center, and she's a clinical toxicologist. And then we have a medical director, which is me. So interesting, let's get into the data. So what we collect, age, gender, obvious, substances, all that are involved how much approximately, and as you can imagine, historically, it's hard to get really accurate information, but we're just, we, are, we are beholden to what is being reported to us. The root of exposure is important. The reason, obviously, for today's discussion is really important is, you know, what's the intentionality? Did you do this on purpose or did you not do it on purpose? And if you didn't do it on purpose, what happened? Therapeutic um, um, errors, there's just general, um, you know, a child was exploratory, got into it. Um, if you're intentionally doing it, misuse is different from abuse. Misuse is you did not use that particular drug or whatever that substance is were for its intended use. Um, and a story I, I've got, so there's a, a person who had arthritis of the knee, was not getting her um, pain controlled. So what she did is she took a, um, an over-the-counter uh, medication that's usually used for um, upset stomach, um, and she took it because of the amount of calcium in it, because she thought that it would help her bones, and then she was also spraying her knee with WD-40 to help her with her pain. Both of those are not intended uh, use, so we would count that as a misuse of a product. Um, clinical information, when our patients go to the hospital, we follow them, um, and we a lot of times do consultation with the care providers in the hospital. We record all that clinical information, including lab work, diagnostic imaging, and others. The site, was it at home? Did they go into a hospital? You know, where, if they did go to a hospital, did they get admitted to an ICU 
Did it go to the ED? Was it just a clinic? We record that information as well. Um, and that's part of the disposition. Medical outcome is what happened. So did they have a major, moderate, minor outcome? Was there no, um, was there no effects? Was there death? Um, so we record that and we follow our cases to outcome and then what therapies or interventions were involved. So this is a picture, this is from the National Poison Data System, and I should say the National Poison Data System is the America's Poison Center's big repository of data that every poison center, when you're entering these cases into it, every eight minutes, all 55 poison centers load their cases into the National Poison Data System. And as you can see, this one goes out uh, to the, the data we have for, uh, through 2022, uh, to, yes, 2022. And here, um, that year, there were over 2 million reports to poison centers that year. Um, and as you can see, it's like 6,000 encounters or so per day um, in the database. Um, I just show this because so we used to get take all these drug identification questions. So, hey, my child got into this pill that fell on the ground. Can you identify this drug for me? I don't know what it is. Um, so that has gone down because we have uh, the Internet, and so Google's very good at giving pictures for people of what these drugs look like, and so those calls have gone down. But what has gone up is these are um, healthcare facility calls. So our calls um, from healthcare facilities, especially hospitals, um, for patients that have come in after ingesting or being exposed to some substance or medication have gone up. And where it's difficult um, but great for us is that um, these cases are more complicated and more complex. They take a little bit more time, and the patients in general are sicker. This is a depiction of uh, a, a least, uh, least squares logistic regression, looking at the seriousness of the cases that poison centers have seen. And as you can see, the, the baseline is 2,000, and so these percentages are the increase from 2,000. And you can see, obviously, in that line there um, of that re uh, regression, you can see that the cases over time have gotten more and more serious that are called to poison centers. Um, and, so, and then the number of cases with the less serious cases is going down. Um, there, I will say, just I'll quickly go through this. This is um, a depiction of something that we were tracking for a while, a substance of interest, of high interest. Um, the edibles portion of this is something that um, we, um, Dr. Doyon and I were talking about this, and um, we can probably, as poison centers, do a little bit better job of tracking some of these cases, but we can track them. And if you look, you like edibles in this particular high-interest product um, has gone up significantly. And so I think edibles, no matter what the, form, uh, what the drug, whatever the medication is, um, are going to be of high interest in the future. So why do we care about any of this? So the little kid, you can see a little kid looking over. Most of these are exploratory. Um, that's why little kids get into these. And so if you look at our data, it's mostly like, hey, there was a drug sitting around. I wanted to put it in my mouth and see what happened. Um, that's usually the case. Um, little, little, uh, Dr. Lynn showed some data, and I'm going to show you some that looks very similar to hers, that um, the younger you are, so the kids under one, they don't get into that many drugs, probably because of mobility is one of the big things. But as you get a little bit older, you're more mobile, you have to be even more careful because then kids really can move over, get to drugs, and they really want to put them in their mouth. You get a little older and you think, oh, these are really cool, um, and I want to check these out. Oh, I want to put it in my mouth. It can't be that bad because they look like candy, so they really can't hurt me, uh, which is you know, definitely not the case. And then as you get older, younger adults also, I think, um, um, I think it was mentioned earlier that um, it's deemed also in adult, by adults that if you um, have a gummy or a food-like product, it is deemed that those are not as dangerous as the actual pills, and that's definitely the case as well. And so young adults um, um, sometimes will experiment with those as well. And then as we get older as well, there are some times where we get confused by the way the drugs look and medications look. And so that's what is you know, behind some of the, the cases that we get on our older uh, citizens. Um, where they got confused by the way a drug looked and may have maybe took too much of their own or they took their spouses that when it was in the house that they shouldn't or whatever. So getting into some of the data, if you look, um, so the big, this is always very shocking to people, but um, if you look, under five, so zero to five years, about a little over 40% of all the reports to poison centers was in that small age range. 
So October, a little over 2 million cases, about over a little bit over 40% of the reports came in in that small age range. And then you can see down here, this obviously doesn't equal 100% because I just left this large group out um, between 30 and 70 um, because it's very similar to what these look like. But the big message here is that young kids get into medications and those reports come to poison centers. And then this was the, what I was talking about, Dr. Lin's slide, um, looks very similar to ours. If you break out the ages and reports to poison centers, it's that, hey, I'm starting to be mobile and I really want to check out whatever that medication is, so I'm going to go check it out um, and put it in my mouth and see what happens. And so you can see um, of that zero to five age range, the one and two-year-olds have the most reports to poison centers. And then, so what about the reason, like I mentioned intentionality. So these unintentional exposures, as you can see, are by far and away the, the biggest group here. Um, you know, up near 70% of cases are uh, due to unintentional exposures. Um, again, this is like, hey, I, you know, um, you know, kid getting into a medication that they just want to be exploratory with or a therapeutic error or something like that is unintentional. Intentional is um, obviously a self-harm attempt. Um, unfortunately, which is common, abuse of drugs, misuse of drugs, those are really the intentional group. And then you have adverse reactions and unknown. And here, um, just wanted to depict, so if you look at the unintentional group, you see the blue bar there represents the under five group. By far and away, the, most, the biggest group represented there is that um, zero to five pediatric group, followed second by that six to 12. So if you look at zero to 12, makes up the vast majority of those unintentional um, report, uh, overdoses and exposures to poison centers. And I'll finish up here. So this is a medical outcome, just to round this out. Um, most of the time, um, nothing bad happens to that zero to five group. Um, but you, and you can see it falls off from none to minor to moderate major in death. There's very few deaths in that zero. I think there were 21 deaths in the zero to five um, group in 2022 reported to our poison centers. Um, obviously, that's an underreport because there's going to be more deaths that are just not called to us. But, um, but what you can see is, you know, as you get a little older, the, that, that decrease shrinks. So you see the six to 12 group, a little bit more um, – a little bit more um, severe um, uh, outcomes here um, because I think as you get older, your intentionality changes, which is why um, some of those severe outcomes are more represented here as people are getting older. And this is just a representation of the percentages of these, um, sort of just start talking about the same point, um, which is most of the cases, especially in the zero to five group, um, are, are there's really no, no significant effect, but we do have those cases where there are, and those are really, um, they're preventable. Um, and so there are things that we can do, which is why I'm glad we're talking about this. There are things that we can do to prevent some of these things from happening, especially in that young age category. So last I will say is um, we wanted to talk about some guidelines. So if you look, this is on the left. Um, a acetaminophen guideline um, that was recently done that was a, um, a project that was a collaboration among all of our poison centers and our sister societies as well. And um, we, we came together to put this together. And this is really more consensus guideline, like talking to people from various poison centers um, to, and, and, and other of our colleagues to put together this consensus guideline. So that's a consensus guideline. This one on the right, um, atypical antipsychotics. Um, this is just a representation of one that we did recently um, where it was an internal guideline using our own poison center data and statistical analysis in order to come up with what uh, people should do, should not do. Um, and these are some, you know, for example, some send in, when do we send people in based on what dose will we send them to the hospital? Um, that's represented here as well. This is more of an internal guideline. I put this, this is a, um, this is a product of, of high interest. Um, that we re recently um, in Colorado got a lot of calls about is, hey, what do you guys do with this particular product? How do you know when to send someone to the hospital? So what we did is we went through all of our charts of this particular product, um, and we um, pulled all the cases um, for, for children um, that, may, that were exposed to this particular product and looked to see what happened to them based on the data that we collect. And we were able to do the statistical analysis and come up with a recommended dose where even in the absence of symptoms at the time, we would recommend that a child go to seek health care because there's a chance that that 
child um, is going to have a clinical exacerbation in a negative way. And so, again, this is using poison center data. This is using our, um, our, our expertise, our experience, our, our data and our statistical analyses in order, in order to be able to put these sorts of things out to help our, our colleagues and help uh, parents as well. So uh, we talked about some poison center functions, data, um, trends, and how guidelines are approached. I think we're going to do questions at the end, so um, I'll leave it right there. Thank you, Dr. Hoyt. So our final speaker for this session is Dr. Suzanne Doyon. Dr. Doyon is the director of the Connecticut Poison, I'm sorry, the Connecticut Poison Control Center and associate professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine, both at UConn Health. The title of Dr. Doyon's talk is Pediatric Ingestions of Gummy Formulated Medications. Thank you, and I believe I'm the last speaker today uh, before the panel, so thank you for sticking it out. Um, so I've been here all day, and I wanted to summarize at least some of the stuff I heard from this morning. I heard about um, the use of the word chewable gels. I love that new term. I learned about overage, and I even heard something mentioned to, along the lines of 400%. I heard stuff about taste and plant lard, something I'd never heard about before. I heard about 3D printing. Um, I heard about, uh, or I saw blister packs with QR codes in it, and I thought to myself, I'm not sure the American consumer is ready for a QR code, but there it is. Um, I heard about unusual combinations of medications uh, uh, achieved by 3D printing. Uh, from the panel, I heard that we're, we set out to create a palatable product, not candy. We should remind ourselves of that. Uh, on the second uh, part of the morning, that children are able to swallow pills from two speakers. I also heard that in a controlled setting, a controlled medication made into a gummy can be safely administered. Um, and from the afternoon, I heard that, you know, we have to think about the unintended consequences of the decisions that we make. Uh, it's on that topic, I think, that poison centers are invited uh, to the conversation. Um, so I, um, where, how do we advance slides? How did you guys, oh, there we go. Oh, no, that's a previous one. Okay, so, sorry, these are my objectives. We're gonna go over just a few scenarios um, and then poison center data from my poison center. NICE data, because I just wanna make a parallel right there. We heard about NICE data already. I'm gonna talk a little bit about literature um, as it pertains to uh, uh, how we package medications and then the final point, point on imprints and embossing. So um, when I was um, confronted, not confronted, but asked uh, to speak here, I actually went to my staff, the people who actually answer the calls, to the, the tune from my poison center of hundreds of calls per year. What are the scenarios you're hearing about when a gummy preparation is involved, and strictly a gummy preparation? And by far the most common scenario, by far, by far, by far, from, again, the entirety of my staff, is the children are breaking through the child-resistant containers. They're jumping, not jumping, they're climbing, they're getting into uh, uh, cupboards, but they're breaking through those child-resistant containers. So we must keep that in mind, that even though something is in a child-resistant container, it doesn't really, really mean the child cannot get into. I've also heard that um, this was the second most common scenario. The parent uh, opens up the child-resistant container, takes one or two of the gummies, sets them out, for siblings, but the little toddler who is not meant to receive the, the gummies comes and just slaps them all up. And if there are multiple sub siblings getting multiple chewables, it can easily go into eight or ten chewables right then and there. So that's a common scenario. Um, I've heard a couple of other uh, scenarios, uh, a babysitter uh, or babysitters um, not knowing which of the gummies are, are medications and which of the gummies are actually gummies giving the patient or the child, you know, a what they thought was a candy gummy when in fact it was a, um, a, 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 a dietary supplement or something like that. And then the parents coming home and, and kind of realizing the issue and calling. So those would have been the, the more common scenarios that we heard. But by far, by far, by far, it's children breaking through the child-resistant packaging. And in the words of one of um, my poison specialists, is like the reward is candy. <laughs> They're kids. <laughs> what can we do? Um, 
we've heard about these other scenarios. And again, I know there are a lot of manufacturers listening to this. I know there are a lot of manufacturers in the room. I want you to listen to the next scenario very carefully. A four-year-old. Now, you saw by the slides that four-year-olds are not our primary age. It's usually the one-and-a-half-year-old, the two-year-old. But the four-year-old was playing with gummies. They were shaped like little grapes. She was feeding them to her stuffed animal because that's what four-year-olds do is they play with their, with their stuffed animals. And then one for the animal, one for me, one for the animal, one for me, so on and so forth. And then the other scenario, something else, again, for CDC perhaps to pay attention to, an eight-year-old got into melatonin um, gummies. Uh, he was having, mom was asleep. He was having trouble falling asleep. So he went to mom's sleep candy, because that's what mom cat called it, her candy for sleep. So if it's good enough for mom, should be good enough for me. An eight-year-old, right? An eight, there's a bit of thought process here. It's not really that unsupervised ingestion that we hear about. And he took a whole bunch of them and so on and so forth. Um, so these scenarios are important to remind ourselves uh, of as we, again, think about these issues. Okay, so I want to show poison center data. Um, and uh, this is from my poison center um, and I had to do a lot of kind of digging to get these data. But basically, for every call that comes in, uh, our poison specialist type in notes. And in the notes, uh, there will be the word gummy if the product in question was a gummy. And the reason I had to go through those notes and use a natural language processing is because before I heard about chewable gels, our... Our melatonin products, just to use melatonin as an example, would come maybe as a liquid, maybe as a solid. Those would be the two sort of categories, or which of the two do you choose, that kind of stuff. So, so to really get down to the gummy, I had to use some pretty extensive natural language processing, get some data and in, uh, people involved. I had to read through 2,700 records to basically give you this slide. But you, I went back 10 years. So you see that there's a rapid uptick in the year 2019-2020 or so in our gummy ingestions. Now, the state of Connecticut is about 3.4 million people. It's about 1% of the entire population of the United States. It has a, a proportionality of um, uh, Hispanic or Latinx people and, and uh, black people and, and that is very, very similar to the distribution in the United States. So often when we pick up a signal at the Connecticut Poison Center, we just multiply it by 100, roughly, and gives us an idea of what's going on nationally. So again, just use that a little bit as you're looking at this. But you see that my staff or my poison specialists are answering 400 or so such calls per day. That's more than one per day in the state of Connecticut. Again, multiply that and you get into uh, a lot. And, and we heard this morning that the, um, th these are calls about gummies. Uh, any gummy, really. Um, and we heard this morning that the, there is predicted over the next 10 years or so a five- to six-fold increase in gummy activity, gummy market. So multiply this by 100 and multiply this by six, and this is where we are in 2030. We're really talking not quite millions of exposures, but, but a lot of exposures per year. So just realize that this is getting to be a problem. The signals are there. But what happened during those years? What happened in 2019? What happened in 2020? So this is, again, where I had to do a lot of digging. And these are, uh, read them from left to right, and then uh, the first line, and then the second line, and so on and so forth. It's those same 10 years, and I looked at every single product, and I reclassified it into a vitamin or a multivitamin. That would be the blue. And then uh, the melatonin, which would be, excuse me, would be, excuse me, the dark orange, and then we have others. So in terms of vitamins, it doesn't matter if it's a children's vitamin, if it's a prenatal vitamin, it's a multivitamins for adults, a hair and nail vitamin, I had all kinds of different vitamins there, ascorbic acid only, vitamin D, uh, 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 vitamin, they all got classified into vitamins in my book and that became vitamins. Um, and then melatonin was pretty much melatonin. So the others in there, um, there are uh, some laxatives out there that are in gummy form. There are some probiotics, I believe, that are in gummy form, a couple of other things. Funny enough, none of them, and maybe some of you are veterinarian pharmacists, but none of these were um, veterinarian preparations. There are chewable-ish preparations, you know, for dogs and cats and so on and so forth. None of them were. I, I was a little bit surprised about that, and maybe I just didn't read the cases. Again, 2,700. There were a lot. Uh, but anyways, just letting you know about that. You see elderberry making a bit of an entry there as well in 2019. But I think if you look at this, you see, yes, 
the blue, the amount of blue reduces, but but remember, you have a proportionality issue here. Then the total number goes up. So so is it, you know you you have to kind of do those gymnastics in your mind. And what I mean by that is, for example, in the year 2021, we answered around 170 such calls that involve vitamins. Uh, excuse me, 152 that involve vitamins, and it was 227 that involve vitamins in 2013. So, you know, yes, we're answering less calls about vitamins, but yeah, how big is that? Um, and is 2023? No, 2020. Uh, and, and in 2022, it's 175 for vitamins. So again, how much did our vitamins, our actual number of vitamins, go up or down? Not that much, but what really, really strikes you is that orange, that dark orange piece of pie, uh, and it goes up and up and up, and you see it really starting to take off in 2019 in a significant way, 2020 significant way. It takes over vitamins, really, uh, in, in, in 2021, and, and, and gets reduced a little bit in 2022. So it seems like melatonin gummies is really the explanation for that uh, uptick uh, in those years. Uh, this was somewhat picked up by CDC. So the CDC put up an MMWR and on melatonin ingestions in children, and they they noticed or or, or published uh, an increase in uh, again melatonin exposures in children, uh, and they explained it by the fact that COVID had something to do with it. People just purchased more melatonin during COVID. I would argue that that might be part of the reason, but I think really, uh, if you look, their increase is 20, most notable in 2019, 2020, which is when our gummies in Connecticut seem to really have taken off. I think that's what uh, part of the explanation as well. There is gummy. There's a lot of gummy and melatonin out there, and that's what we're seeing. A nice data that was already explained to you a little bit. Nice data is there are 5,000 or so emergency departments in the United States. Nice data has uh, sampled, um, uh, you know, a representative sample of 100 of them. Collect data from these uh, 100 emergency departments. Those data are publicly available. There are coded data in there and narrative data as well. And uh, those data were collected by um, a Texas poison center and presented at a meeting three weeks ago uh, in Montreal. So I happened to kind of stumble on them. It was a t So we had a great talk and, and we followed it up with some phone calls and some Zooms. So I was able to kind of really get to what they were saying. With this was a poster presentation. So because it's a poster presentation, you won't be able to find it on PubMed because it's a poster presentation. So I really kind of uh, dug with them to try to, uh, to get to what it is that they were doing. But they did something very, very similar, excuse me, to what I was trying to show you with the Connecticut uh, data. Uh, so those narratives or little, you know, kind of handwritten or dictated, you know, stories, uh, and they use natural language processing to look for the word gummy, just like I did in my database, but this is a different database. Uh, they went back 22 years. I went back 10 years, fine. And their threshold is children under four. My threshold was children under six. Typically, poison center data is presented as children under six or children up to five years of age. Think of it whichever way you want. And, and I did it for much fewer years. I had, you know, 2,700 cases to go through. They did it for a total of 10 years. They had 193 cases to go through. So their job was a lot easier than mine. Um, excuse me, that's the wrong button. Okay, so these were the these was a chart that they presented. So again, see a big uptake in the the word gummies in these emergency department visits in children under four years of age, um, and uh, you see my data showing an uptick in 2019, and their data showing again in. in boxes, but still, still pretty much uh, showing the same thing. And they separated their data as well. They had a proportion of melatonin that was 50.3% um, and multivitamins 24%, just to show it with mine. Uh, this was 20, 2021 for them, so I'm presenting 2021. So I had vitamins at 39%. They had vitamins at 24%. I had melatonin at 44%. They had melatonin at 50%. 
remember there's a bit of a difference here. Poison center data sometimes reflect what goes on in the household. Not everybody that we get called about gets referred to the emergency department. So it's a slightly, slightly different different scenario. And not surprisingly, because most multivitamins, even when taken in excessive amounts, can be safely managed in the home, we tend to have a little bit more of sort of uh, those, and, 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 and they end up, because they're in the emergency department, a higher proportion of melatonin. Melatonin, not quite as well tolerated in the home, so they get preferred into the emergency department. So bottom line, two databases that look at the same issue from different uh, angles, pointing really, really in the same direction, that we seem to have a problem with gummies in children and and. Multivites are part of the problem, but it sounds like melatonin is part of the problem as well. And I just want to reiterate, I don't know if you spent a little, after doing all this, I went to my local retail pharmacy just to see, like, how are these melatonin gummies packaged? I want to see how what this looks like and so on and so forth. So I, I spent a little bit of time at my retail pharmacy, and if it's a melatonin 5 milligram tablet, a tablet, not a gummy, a tablet, no child-resistant packaging, at least the products I saw. If it's a, uh, a melatonin gummy, child-resistant packaging. I just thought that was very, very interesting. But the vast, vast majority of the gummies that I had read about that I found on the shelf, again, they're all over the counter, they're right there, uh, were in child-resistant packaging. I didn't find a single one that was not in a child-resistant packaging. And you know what that means. I mean, it's just like the push and turn and all that kind of good stuff. Okay. Um, so um, I want to uh, look, uh, take a little bit of deep dive or take you on a little bit of a journey to look at the medical literature and, and, and where my next recommendation or next uh, point comes from. It's Halloween. I put some Halloween candy there, but there's a reason for that big advocate of unit dose packaging, individual wrapping. I think, I think it's something we need to spend some time thinking about. So the first time we kind of thought about this in poison center circles was uh, with um, – this was published in 2005. It doesn't uh, translate well here, but this is a publication from 2005 from Milton Tenenbein, one of the titans in poison center circles. Um, some of you might be old enough to remember how iron used to be prescribed and how iron kind of is made, the different iron salts and so on and so forth. But just to give you a recap, in the 1990s and before, uh, iron ingestions in children were problematic, associated with deaths every year in the United States. And when you did a little bit of digging, you figured out pretty quickly that it was usually the ferrous sulfate preparation that was the problem. The typical ferrous sulfate preparation is 325 milligrams with 65 milligrams of elemental iron per unit dose. A typical 10 kilogram child needs only seven or eight tablets to get into the toxic range, a, a few more than that to get really in the lethal range. There's ferrous gluconate out there. There's ferrous fumarate. Um, there are now polysaccharide ions, a whole host of different iron preparations. But by and large, the ferrous fumarate and ferrous gluconate salts are usually actually found in the, pre, um, the, the over-the-counter market, but they're usually not nearly as problematic as ferrous sulfate. We knew that in the 1990s. And we approached a number of agencies, including FDA, to do something, do something, do something. And some of you that are old enough to remember will remember that in 1997, something changed dramatically uh, uh, about the dispensing of ferrous sulfate products in the entire United States. Of course, it was in child-resistant packaging, had been, and because of the, the 1970s uh, uh, Child uh, Poisoning Prevention Act, you know, it had to be in, in child-resistant packaging. But what changed was on top of child-resistant packaging, these ferrous sulfate preparations, again, ferrous sulfate 325 with 65 milligrams of elemental iron per unit dose, had to also be in a blister pack. So for you that are pharmacists, you understand what that means. Blister pack in the child resistant, the bottles were huge <laughs> because you had to fit the blister packs in there. I invite you to go get this publication because it's still to this day sends chills down my spine. And I, I, I'm afraid I didn't copy the table for you, although I have it written there, uh, uh, printed there for you. It looks at the number of deaths prior to 1997 and after 1997, therefore in 1998, zero. 1999, one, 2000, zero. The 1999 death, I believe, was uh, to a pre-1998 product. Um, it's just chilling to see death, 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 and then zero. 
zero, zero. An, an absolute marvel of, of you know, kind of um, um, public health. Um, so we learned from that that um, child resistant packaging has its limitations, but adding unit dose packaging seemed to really strengthen that public health measure. So this was looked at by other people. This is a publication from actually Rocky Mountain Poison Center, their radars project. Um, for those of you who don't know, buprenorphine um, was available as a sublingual lozenge initially, but then the manufacturer made it into a sublingual film. We have bioavailability issues with buprenorphine, so it has to be administered sort of intrabucally or, you know, under the tongue. So they, they and the film looked a little bit like the Listerine, uh, you know, mint, mint things, if, you, if you've seen them. Uh, but in so doing, the, the um, so it's kind of difficult to put films, I guess, in a bottle or in, in those to moisture, they would kind of crim crimple up or whatever. There were issues with it. So um, they packaged every uh, sublingual film in a envelope, a foil envelope. It actually had a, a barcode on it. But, but as you were dispensed your buprenorphine, it's actually buprenorphine naloxone, was a suboxone product, but anyways, um, you had, so you opened up the bottle, child-resistant bottle, and then in it you would have a number of those little envelopes, and then you would use those envelopes and so on and so forth. Um, but it's unit dose packaging, just like the iron was unit dose packaging in a child-resistant packaging, and they too were capable of showing that when you zero in on that product and look at poison center data, you can clearly, clearly show that the number of unintentional pediatric ingestions plummeted after the introduction of this product. So yet another engineering uh, 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 that uh, resulted in sort of public health uh, 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 good. And lastly, this is from the UK. I just want to mention this. In the UK, they, they have a problem with acetaminophen over there, paracetamol in there uh, 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 is what they call it over there. They have a lot more overdoses than we have here in the United States per patient population. They decided to address this by limiting a number of things, but one of the things they did was to make their, um, their paracetamol blister packs. And it didn't so much influence pediatric uh, dosing, um, or it may have, they, if they did, it did, they didn't publish it. But what it really, really helped was decrease the number of teenagers suicidal ingestions because, and that were severe and resulting in death because they had to do the blister pack thing, and, then, and that takes a lot of time, this, that, and the other. Um, so just another example of how unit dose packaging seems to do some public good. So I've shown you three aspects of the medical literature that really, really support sort of unit dose packaging. Uh, and lastly, my last point would be on embossing and imprints. I, I have no idea how you can emboss or imprint anything on a gel, but embossing and imprinting is important. It may not be important to you in the room, but it is definitely important to us in poison center circles. You have no idea how many times a child gets into the tablet and the only thing that we have to indicate what the child got into is the other tablet the child did not ingest and it's got an imprint on it and that's all we have to go for or go with. And so being able to quickly identify the ingredients in a pharmaceutical product based on the tablet imprint is essential to the functioning of poison center. I'm an emergency physician is essential to my functioning as a physician. Uh, we get calls also from law enforcement. They arrest people, they have pills in their pockets and then we're trying to figure out what's going on with all of this. Again, um, tablet imprints, very, very helpful. So um, I don't want uh, this discussion to not touch upon the importance of either embossing or a tablet imprint. So lastly, um, I, I hope I've, I've convinced you uh, of the um, public health implications of what it is that we're discussing today. If you were to ask me my personal opinion, my personal opinion is let's not go down the chewables, let's not go down the gel route, let's not have all these over-the-counter products in gel forms. We've shown children will get into them and it's going to be a serious problem. But if that train or that horse has left the barn or the train is down the train tracks or whatever, then, then strong, strong, strong guardrails, very strong guardrails. And I would urge everybody in the room to think about unit dose packaging beyond just child-resistant packaging, uh, as well as all the measures that I talked about. So thank you.
Thank you once again, Dr. Doyon. So uh, we're running a little over time, um, uh, but our third panel um, will run from 3 to 3.50, but um, given our time, I'm still going to suggest a short break, a uh, um, five-minute stretch break um, just until 3.05, um, and then we'll go ahead and get started with our panel session. And just a quick, uh, I'm sorry, uh, quick point I wanted to, as we take our stretch break, we've gotten a lot of questions about um, specific products and um, regulatory processes. Um, we have a couple of online resources available, um, so please refer to that. Um, we have um, for co a comprehensive resource for information on human drug development and regulation. Um, please see the link to the Cedar Small Business and Industry Assistance webpage. Um, and also for some information on OTC monograph products, uh, please refer to monographs at FDA. And the last link that we have is for safety and adverse event reporting information. Um, you can refer to the MedWatch webpage. Uh, so, uh, again, all of our speakers for this session um, previously, are, they are joining us again for the panel. So as a reminder, we have Dr. Cindy Connolly, Dr. Jennifer Lind, Dr. Christopher Hoyt, and Dr. Suzanne Doyon. And in addition to our speakers in person, or our panelists in person, we have uh, Ms. Mary Beth uh, Civilis, who is also joining us virtually. And this panel discussion will go until 3.50. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christine Parboni, who will be moderating this session. Um, so Dr. Parboni is an associate professor at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy in the Department of Practice, Sciences, and Health Outcomes Research. Dr. Parboni is a pediatric clinical pharmacy specialist and also serves as the director of postgraduate graduate training at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. So welcome. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm excited to be here, and thank you all for sticking around. I realize it's the last session of the day. Um, hopefully you all have learned as much as I have from um, all of our great speakers. Uh, and I would like to share, I also work in the pediatric ICU at um, the University of Maryland Children's Hospital, and I've taken a lot of um, patients in who have come in with poisonings and made my own calls to the poison centers and actually spent some time in the poison center um, when I was a, a resident uh, learning. So I appreciate all of you guys' input. I want to far, first start off with asking each of you um, the question of the day is of what would you define a candy-like drug product to be from your professional perspective um, and what characteristics maybe contribute to that definition uh, for you? And maybe if we could start with um, Dr. Connolly. Sure. Um, can, you can hear me, correct? All right. So, um, so I'll ask. I'll answer that two ways. As as a historian and trying to put my myself back into what those aspirin makers or actually the the uh, developers of the broad spectrum antibiotics in the late 1940s, early 1950s were in a major arms race to do the, the same thing, and this is all in the FDA archives. You can see them writing back and forth. We need to have a pediatric formulation. I think they were, they were consciously trying to get, uh, again, color, uh, flavor, um, basically anything that they could appeal, that could get uh, children to, to take, and as much like uh, that they could sort of say it tastes like your favorite candy in an era where I think that there certainly was not the knowledge about over-ingestion and poison that we have now. And so it was a strategy to get kids to take the medicine. I guess I would say as a pediatric nurse, it's using um, growth and development knowledge and theory to deliberately manipulate taste, flavor, texture in order to make it uh, appeal to uh, children of you know, a certain age, a two-year-old versus a three-year-old versus a, um, a, a four-year-old. And so I, I hope that that answers this. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much. Dr. Lind? Yes, sure. So at CDC, we actually don't have a formal definition, but I did um, chat with my colleagues about it and some of the characteristics that we talked about um, that we think might make a drug product be more candy-like would be a lot of the things that have already been mentioned, um, appealing flavoring or taste, shape, color, consistency, smell, sugary coatings or appealing packaging, things that look like toys or candies that kids would know. Um, would all kind of go into that, what we would classify as a, a gummy or, or, or a candy-like product. 
I don't have too much to add to what's been said already. I would just you know say that um, also when you look at those studies that look at you know some of these candy products, candy-like products, and whether or not people can tell them apart from the actual candy versus the medication, I would say really anything that we would look at and reasonably we would say any reasonable person would look at it and have a di- sort of difficult time telling the difference between the two because a little kid that's two You know, we're talking about it from an adult standpoint, but a little kid that's two is not going to be able to tell those apart. And they're not really going to try to discern whether or not, like, hey, is this, is this candy or is this actually a medication? And so, to me, the word reasonable comes in. And what I mean by reasonable is thinking like a two-year-old. Would a two-year-old be able to tell those things apart um, is sort of where I would also add and put that definition. I think the the day started with, I know it when I see it. (laughs) Uh, I don't think anybody has a great definition for what a candy-like medication uh, is. Um, I agree with what has been said before. I think it has a shape, the taste, the look, the feel, the texture of some existing candy. There you go. But what about future candies? Um, So it's a very, very difficult question to answer. And Dr. Doyen, I, I think one of my questions for you, I know you focused on gummy-like products, but I don't know if you saw in your um, investigations of were there other types of things that were candy-like, maybe that weren't gummy-focused? or Well, there are plenty of gums uh, out there um, and uh, different kinds of chewables. Again, are chewables candy, augmented mm-hmm. chewable, for example, yeah. kind of candy. Um, uh, but there are plenty of gums. So I, I honestly didn't go into the gum products uh, that would, be another deep dive, probably another 2,000 <laughs> cases. I just don't have the time. Uh, but uh, I, I, gum, I think, should be somewhat classified under candy. I, I think most people would consider gum to be candy. So, again, very, very difficult to define a candy. Our next question asks, are there particular therapeutic classes of drugs that pose greater risk if supplied in a candy-like formulation? And we'll go ahead. Yes, Dr. Doyen. Oh, boy. Opioids, big time. <laughs> uh, but you must remember, there are a lot of people who are taking at home chemotherapeutic agents. There, there's some stuff out there really, really difficult. Uh, we have a list at poison centers of the one tablet can kill. Um, so those definitely would make the list. Our calcium channel blockers, uh, bupropion, and, and, the, and the strengths that it's available in would be pro- – so there are many, many ash poison centers. We'll be able to give you a list. Um, in the realm of uh, non-prescription products, again, we're talking over-the-counter stuff, uh, ibuprofen, naproxen, acetaminophen, um, I-, I wouldn't say they're harmless. No, the dose makes the poison. We have toxic doses for all these things, but, uh, you know, one, two, or three candy chewables, whatever we want to call them, gels, uh, probably uh, not so problematic. But um, the controlled substances would be problematic. A lot of our cardiovascular medications would be problematic. A lot of our psychiatric medications would be problematic. Um, And a lot of our anti-epileptics, to some degree, would be problematic. So that's a a lot of medications. I would say, and if I can just add to that, because Dr. Doyen covered a lot of the things that we came up with, but um, one of the things we also said was like potential for abuse on the prescription side, but then on the OTC side, maybe potential for self-harm as well. Um, so products where, you know, maybe teens or a little bit older um, adolescents might be more likely to utilize or use for self-harm would be something to consider. I'll just add um, one of the medications, not to pick on any medication, but definitely not just the zero to five range, but um, as kids get older and they want to, they read on social media, hey, you can go and get high on certain medications. So diphenhydramine would basically, that would be the poster child for that, that um, swallowing pills is more difficult than chewing a gummy. And so you have to work a little bit harder. Um, to get the dose of diphenhydramine you would need to get, quote, high um, or and or to see the toxic effects of the things that we worry about. Now, that being said, we have plenty of people who get smart. They make vats of water. They put the pills in them. They make slurries out of them so they can drink those down so people get smart with it. But um, diphenhyd- drugs like diphenhyd- diphenhydramine, excuse me, I would be also I put on that list as well. And I guess I would conclude with sort of saying, again, historically, I, I think people um, thought that the, um, in the 1950s when prescription drugs were new, parents were, there's, and there's historical evidence that parents understood that those drugs might have some danger 
to them that that they didn't think necessarily with drugs that were they were getting direct advertised in magazines like parents um, that in an era before direct to consumer advertising for all drugs and I think anecdotally um, as a nurse in the 21st century there are still a lot of people who don't really have a sense of the history of over-the-counter drugs and think that someone has tested them to make sure that they are absolutely safe for the you know for all consumers um, and that so I do think that I don't know if it's as much a drug class as I would sort of say over-the-counter drugs partly because they're ubiquity partly because I think there is in some people historically and today a false sense of safety from them and um, I'll share I appreciated your aspirin historical perspective um, we had just put out some data from the last 20 years of aspirin ingestions and me as a pediatric pharmacist I feel like it had been ingrained in me, you know, no aspirin for kids, no aspirin for kids, except for the small group of people. But there's still aspirin ingestions and exposures, and there's still 2,000 a year reported to poison centers, you know, and I definitely didn't expect to see that data that it's still out there as a potential harm for our, our kids, even though it's over the counter and we've gotten, gotten rid of the, you know, child flavor. Right. They're still taking it. <laughs> Um, consi considering current strategies for reducing the risk of accidental exposure of drug products, what role does labeling and packaging play? And I think um, Dr. Doyen spent a little bit of time on that, but any other thoughts on how that can help us um, limit the abuse of these candy-like dosage forms for other products? I can chime in a little bit. One of the things that we didn't mention in terms of the packaging, um, also sometimes over the over the over the counter products, they tend to be transparent bottles as well. So you know you have these bottles with gummies and things in there of all of these assorted colors to a young child, a two year old. They can't tell the difference. So maybe considering having the packaging be opaque, so it's less appealing for kids to try and you know break that barrier. Um, also having you know pills in unit dose packaging, we've mentioned that. Um, as a good way to limit um, some of the access, but then also to like within the bottle, maybe individually wrapping. Um, I know some of the chews are individually wrapped within the packaging, so even if the child breaks the child-resistant um, barrier, then there's still that kind of having to open up each individual one, which might limit some of the access. Go ahead. So uh, something I forgot to mention. So as you have unit dose packaging, so of course it creates an extra barrier for the child to get into the product, which means it's going to take more time for the child to get into the product. Right. The more time it takes, the longer the parent has to discover, intervene, stop, and so on and so forth. So um, uh, think about it that, well as, that way as well. And something else to remember now, we get called, uh, the poison center gets called, and the child got into the bottle of gummies. And you're like, well, how many did they get into? Again, the dose makes the poison. So, oh, I don't know, the bottle. You know, if you have individual unit dose packaging, well, how many empty wrappers are there? Or how many broken blisters are there? Or, you know, I don't know, whatever it is. Five. Okay, well, that's something I can work with. I can, and I can do some dose calculations and can decide whether this is going to be a problem for your child or not, as opposed to, I don't know, the bottle is open. I don't know how many were in there. I don't know how many the child got into. We're like, okay, well, then we send the child to the emergency department because worst-case scenario, you know. Um, so keep that in mind. Unit dose packaging adds to the discovery time, but also gives us a clue as to how many the child got into. All great critical kind of points. So I just want to mention and I'm just going to put a plug in. Um, so we are, I would say by we, poison centers are pretty sensitive to this because, um, not because we're trying to be a pain, but because, you know, you know, we, this is a public health institution. We all have heard this, the, the parable about the people walking along the river, people falling in the river. We jump in the river to pull them out of the river. And then right when you get out, there's another person in the river. We have to jump in the river again and pull somebody out. And then finally we get smart. We go upstream and find out why people are falling in the river. So the issue is, is that, People think, oh, why can't people just be smart and parents be smart and just put their medications up? Because if you put their medications up, these two-year-olds should not be able to get into it. But we've seen over time that's not the case. People accidentally leave their medications out. People go to their grandparents' house. The grandparent is not accustomed to having a child there. They leave a medication out. And as Dr. Doyon said, some of those medications are some of the most dangerous ones. And so the point of my, what I'm getting off, I'll get off my soapbox, but my point is saying is that we cannot rely on everyone to all the time have medications put in the right place. And so these other strategies that people are talking about up here will, I, I believe also, I agree with uh, Dr. Doyon, will limit 
the access of little kids to these. And if we can do that, then I think that that's a victory for everybody. And I'll just conclude by saying, yes, I think it's one, the safety packaging is one prong, all right, on a multi-faceted educational uh, campaigns, packaging um, and, and others. And I guess I would sort of, uh, in terms of, of uh, the safety packaging, of what Dr. Diane made me think of, the importance of, right, slowing down the child from getting into that packaging. I don't know that it is possible to build a, um, you know, a package that a three-year-old, a determined three-year-old really can't get um, into um, with, with get, given an unlimited time. And if you ever just have unlimited free time and you want to have some fun, go back and look, um, and I could certainly tell you where they are, the time motion studies that led to the early safety caps, the, the pediatricians and the, um, the engineers are incredibly frustra frustrated. Um, a famous poison uh, control, uh, poison, anti-poison doctor, um, a toxicologist from the University of Utah presents to Congress in, I think, 1969, and he, and he, because Congress is saying, why is it taking you um, so long to develop this cap? And he says, we have one that we were sure, right? Nobody could get into this, um, th this, this, uh, this bottle, but this was still the era of glass packaging. And so they gave it to a room full of three-year-olds, and one little three-year-old takes it and cracks the glass on the edge of the table, which, of course, no adult had thought to do. The glass shatters, it goes everywhere, and the kids are into the what was a sugar um, tablet. And so um, they, it, it was, you know, again, the, a bunch of adults are, it's always going to be very difficult to think like a, a three-year-old um, for us. And they also, another funny, um, and, and there is no visual on this that I can find, is that the, uh, the safety cap uh, committees, the partnerships between industry and academics bring prototypes for the congressmen to play around with, and they all are very frustrated because they can't get into them. And again, I wish someone had thought to take a picture. It would have been great for my book, for this presentation, and just sort of um, for, for history. Thank you. And uh, Mary Beth, I didn't mean to exclude you from the conversation. Have you had anything to add to that? No, not, no, not at this time. I guess just another another anecdote, I guess, related to the one that Dr. Connolly was just was just mentioning a while ago. We we really were digging into the history of, of all of this as well. And um, one of the things we came across was that um, one of the initial designs of the, the child safety caps, you know, they had tested and um, I think it was implemented. And then what they realized was that um, children were were not necessarily very easy. It wasn't very easy for them to open with their hands, but then some kids started to use their mouth and they were easy, they were able to pry it open that way. And so I think currently when they do do the, um, the testing for um, using the Poison Prevention Packaging Act, the, the testing methods, at some point in the testing, I think the, the um, facilitators, you know, tell the, the, the children who are um, in, you know, involved in the testing that, that they can use their mouths if they want to, just because they might not necessarily do it if they, you know, if they see observers watching them, but then given the prompt, well, feel free to, to use your mouth if you want to, then, you know, they might be more inclined to do so. And that's an, another way to. Children to, will find a way. They will find a way. <laughs> um, related to that, I know that several of you have mentioned blister uh, packaging being a potential way to slow down and, and to help with reducing overdoses. Um, on the flip side of that, there is some concern about um, that not being maybe environmentally friendly or, or increasing waste, I guess. Um, any recommendations on how to balance the environmental factor versus the safety aspect? I have not thought that far yet. <laughs> I have not either, but I mean, just in thinking, technology can do a lot, and I know there are a lot of products that are biodegradable now, even like some straws and things like that. So I'm sure smart people could come up with a way. Thank you. Our next question is, um, can you share any insights into candy-like characteristics that may lead adults to misuse or abuse some of these drug products? 
So I can just say <clears throat> for uh, some, I, and this is pure anecdote, um, not done analysis on this, but the stories that I've heard um, um, from young adults first is that that uh, they, this is more therapeutic uh, misuse, is that they believe that the gummy, well, I'm sorry, different formulations, um, they're safer. So you can take more of them and it's okay to take more of them uh, because they're they're because of the way that they're formulated that they don't think that it's like a, taking a pill and so that they think that the dose that they're getting um, is not going to make them um, sick so that they think they can take more of them. I've heard that multiple times from from especially from young adults. If it's made for kids, it must be safe for everyone. Hmm. Um, do we have any insights from pediatric medication overdose prevention efforts that might extend to the geriatric population? Are there differences in medication management challenges with pediatric versus adults? Well, I'm going to say it the opposite way. So uh, one of my colleagues actually did a, a study looking at pill minders for, um, for ger ger our geriatric population. And we, but now, and, and to be said, the, the confounding here is that these are calls to poison centers based on the inappropriate and the inaccurate use of their pill minders for their medications. It is not, uh, it is not uncommon for um, our geriatric population to accidentally take wrong medications out of a pill minder. So I've heard some, you know, we've, we've talked about, you know, some people have actually talked about, well, maybe we should use pill minders for pediatric patients also, because normally their parents will be giving them the medication, so it would be in a pill minder, it would be harder for them to get into it. Um, people are looking at that now. Uh, I, I don't know if that's going to be any better or not. I'll leave that to people with more expertise here who uh, deal with that, but uh, I know that people are looking at that going back from taking it from the geriatric population down to the pediatric population for using pill minders. You would think that pill organizers would take care of problems, but my gosh. Um, they take their evening dose instead of a morning dose. They forgot they take it. It's Tuesday, and they go to the Tuesday, and the Tuesday is empty. <laughs> so it's just like they have no idea what went on. Uh, uh, husband and wife, he takes hers, she takes his. Uh, two different uh, pill organizers. Oh, my gosh, the scenarios are, are, are multifold. But bottom line is, is you know, pill organizers are not the solution, and I have a particular issue with filling a pill minder with candy-like me uh, medications. I think that's just a recipe for disaster. I think a real challenge, of course, is that we expect in the United States, we have so few social supports, we expect until people are very old, and really quite cognitively impaired that they're going to have to medicate, manage their medications completely on their own. And I, I would sort of say, as one of those people who uses a pill minder, again, I think it was you, Dr. Doyan, who mentioned, I, I do find that um, very useful when there is some kind of notation, a number or something inscribed on the pill, because when I'm trying to figure out whether I've dropped my Losartan or my Statin, um, I, it's, and they're small white pills, I, have, I just sort of throw them both away unless I can somehow identify them by the other pills in the bottle. So I, I guess I, I do think that that has potential for help for across the board, but certainly for older people who tend to make, take more medications than younger people. Our next question um, from the audience, I believe, is how do parents perceive gummies for their children? Are parents more likely to overdose their own children using gummies or candy-like drugs um, just because of the dosage form that they are? Any insight from reports? I think parents really want to do well by their children. The overwhelming majority of parents want to do the right thing for their children, so they would never set out to overdose their children. That, that would not, you know, I'm, I'm just going to be very frank about this. However, uh, I did see some patients over the weekend because I was working shifts, and I did have a six- or seven-year-old that was starting him on an antibiotic, and the first d uh, demand or ask from the parents is, is this an antibiotic available as a chewable? 
So I do think that parents are seeking the chewables. Um, and again, when you're age five or six, are you on liquids? Can you take pills? You know, that's kind of that nebulous area there. Usually teenagers, pills are okay. Younger children, liquids are okay. But that, that age group, eh, whatever. Um, and so uh, parents are starting to ask uh, for chewable preparations. This antibiotic was not available in chewable, so there you go. But uh, just, again, anecdotally, I think that with what, what the question that you asked, um, that there's definitely something to that. I think, you know, the standard pill form, um, you know, that everyone has had and using certain medications that have been in pill form, I think the parents, um, I don't think that all parents would do this, but I think that some parents would have the idea uh, erroneously that, um, that they could take more uh, of, a, of a gummy-like medication there, or that it's somehow uh, safer than a pill or whatever that is. I think that anecdotally I have heard that from people, um, uh, but I don't know over a population how that would look, but just in select cases I've definitely heard um, that sort of sentiment. This is uh, Mary Beth Stavoulis, um online. I just wanted to add that um, another characteristic of the product that I thought that might lead parents or caregivers to just assume that there's little risk associated with some of these products that we know of in gummy form that are currently available is that, um, you know, I can say that in my house, you know, I have two kids under six and they take a multivitamin. It is in a gummy form and the dose for them is four of four gummies each. Um, and so, you know, having a dose that so many individual units also might lead one to think that, well, these things are harmless because look, you, I have to take four every single time I take them. And, you know, my kids are very attuned to all of this as well. So if I'm running low on them and I'll give them three, because, you know, I don't have any more, they'll say, oh, wait a minute, you missed one. Like I'm supposed to get another one. Um, and then another issue that we've run in with, into with some of our analyses with the melatonin work is that. Um, we, you know, we're looking into additional details from these case narratives, this text information, and we have some information about how many units the, you know, the children got into, what was the strength of the unit. And then for, for melatonin, this has become quite an issue because we found that they, you know, we found doses as small, an uh, individual unit as, uh, as little as 0.3 milligrams, all the way up to 60 milligrams for just one unit. And so, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what they got into, how many, and what what could the dose have been, the total amount in, ingested, um, it's been very difficult. Melatonin is tricky, various reasons given to pediatric patients. Um, are there any cultural or demographic factors that influence the risk of accidental exposures to candy-like medicines? Um, anything that you've been able to see from some of your data analyses? I haven't looked, but now you gave me a good idea. There you go. Same here. I didn't look at the social determinants of health on those groups, so I cannot answer that. I would just add that in the safety cap work in the 60s, they, they're not collecting a lot of their, uh, data about families, but they do want to know marital status of the mother and they are looking for race and income of the family. I don't know how they I thought they'd use that information. They're not looking for anything else, but that, those are particularly um, important, and I make me think of sort of things that would have been um, th biases that were sort of, that were not even beginning to be acknowledged in the practice of, of medicine or nursing or health care. Hopefully the manufacturers that are maybe on the call are listening to making sure that these are, um, if we're packaging them more safely, that they are still financially available to all people and, and not um, priced at a point that is um, going to disadvantage the mothers. Uh, one of the questions from online is, could some of the poison center calls on gummy-related concerns be calls related to choking versus overdosing? Um, so we have a great way of, of uh, coding for this. These are ingestions, oral ingestions. If they were aspirated or inhaled, uh, the route of administration uh, would have been different. So these are ingestions. They were oral ingestions. Thank you for clarifying. And I should say there were no aspirations, no inhalations uh, in the whole group. I think that's all the calls I see or questions I see from online. Do we have questions from the audience for the panel we have? Yes, sir, in the back. I think we have a microphone coming to you.
a lot of the conversation today <clears throat> went from category to category. We had drugs, supplements, and even cannabis. Do you think the category is important if we're going to be determining what's appropriate in each category, or is it just across the board we should handle it all the same? Does that make sense? Like, because, you, you know, it would be pretty easy to conclude cannabis shouldn't be in candy form, right? But some of the, like, fiber maybe, something with a high dose, hard to consume, things like that. Or does that sort of stop us from being able to solve the problem ultimately of accidental ingestion? It's a good question. Um, I think it gets back to, I think it gets down what the goal is. And if we're trying to make sure that there are no accidental ingestions of kids, then I think, you know, it would have to be a, an across the board thing. But I don't think, you know, if you look at, if you look at all of the substances these kids get into, not all of them are causing significant, you know, significant injury to kids. And so I think we probably, my personal opinion, um, probably should be um, a little targeted, um, look at our data, analyze it as, you know, with all stakeholders and look at the data and analyze it and sort of make it a more targeted thing rather than going after every single uh, substance on the market. But um, that's what I would do is target the ones that we think are going to be more dangerous. But um, I think there probably should be some disagreement with that. So um, the second paper I quoted, the one uh, regarding the buprenorphine naloxone sublingual filth, uh, had a number of authors, and, and if you read their discussion and their conclusion, um, so of course they're talking about buprenorphine and naloxone. Buprenorphine is, is a prescription product. It's also a controlled product. So, of course, they're in that realm, but they do make a good and I think they spent a lot of time thinking about this, but they do make a good point that they're advocating for single-dose packaging for certain products that have been determined to be particularly problematic in children. So I'll echo the comments of my colleague. Uh, perhaps a targeted approach would be preferable. Um, and again, there are people who have thought about this, thought about it for months, um, so I'm going to kind of take their thoughts and, and, and just communicate that to you. But I, I tend to agree with that. Thank you. Another question I've seen from online is, uh, based on research data that you've seen, how likely do parents measure their liquid medications properly? How has it affected the number of overdoses or adverse reactions seen, especially in children? Um, whether they're using teaspoons or MLs, and this kind of speaks to me as a pediatric pharmacist, but I'll let you all um, share from your data. Let's say I, I can jump in um, there. So in the presentation, I hope, you know, from the three-pronged approach, we did talk a little bit about the medication errors, and while the vast majority were unintentional ingestions, there were a percentage that were medication errors and only about 5%. But, I mean, the good thing about this, it is, it is generally preventable, you know, in terms of the med error. So a lot of times if it is in standard metric units that we have found and studies have shown that that decreases the risk of medication errors for parents, um, there was or there has been in the past a perception that maybe parents may not understand milliliters and that, you know, there's this perception, oh, we need to put teaspoons or spoon-based units as well on there, but um, studies of health literacy have shown that parents actually do understand milliliters. Um, and then by having the single metric unit only um, uh, dosing or, or units on dosing devices, that there are less you know, errors with that as opposed to when you have the, the both units or multiple units on um, a dosing device that does increase the chance of like overdosing or underdosing depending on you know, how, what the parent expects it to be. Um, and so yes, you know, that, that is definitely um, an issue. It is a much smaller percentage of what we're seeing in terms of ED visits. Um, however, you know, we have found ways to, to prevent it. And I don't know, I mean, Mary Beth, do you have anything additional that you want to share in, front of, in terms of data? Just in terms of the data, when we looked a little bit more closely and, and what those errors were, I mean, most of them were dosing errors. Um, you know, we, we see some errors that are, you know, wrong route of administration or maybe the, you know, the wrong drug was given by mistake, but um, most of them are dosing errors. Um, 
And then also most of them involve, you know, of the dosing errors, most of them involve liquid medications. And we don't always have the level of detail to see what the, the underlying or the root cause was, but some of the ones that um, Dr. Lynn just mentioned were, you know, the mixing different units of measure, maybe using um, household spoons to administer medications also can be problematic because, you know, they're, they're not standardized in any way and you know, there's mixing up tablespoons and teaspoons and such. Well, I just want to relate just a, a scenario from this weekend. Again, I worked this weekend um, prescribing an antibiotic to a family, uh, to the child. Uh, and I was uh, talking to the family. And it's, it's going to be one teaspoon um, twice a day, whatever. Um, and so this was a two-year-old COVID baby, right? Um, and the parents were probably in their late 20s. And she goes, I don't understand what a teaspoon is. Can you explain this to me in MLs? And I was just so happy, <laughs> just so happy. I, I think I think our young parents um, are moving towards the metric system. I think acetaminophen is now dispensed with a syringe. They're getting used to it. And again, these young parents are really, really, they all want to do the right thing for their child. So I was just greatly, and I'm like, do you have a syringe at home? You're new used to syringes. They go, yeah, talk to us in syringes, you know, kind of a syringe language. I was more than happy to do that. And again, I'm sharing the story with you. So this tells you how happy I was with the story. I just want to add to that. So Rachel Myers, a pediatric pharmacist again, so I love that. Um, I think one thing FDA could do to help us with that is stop labeling the medications per 5 ml. All the antibiotics are like amoxicillin, 400 milligram per 5 ml. That is from the era of when we dosed in teaspoons, and that yep. era is gone. And yep. that is my big, one of my biggest wishes. It needs to be just per ml. Nobody cares how much per 5 ml anymore. It's not relevant information. So too much math. And this would apply to over-the-counter products also, not just the antibiotics, but the Tylenols, the ibuprofens, all that stuff over-the-counter. Yes, in the back. Um, so a lot of interesting suggestions about packaging and things like that. And, you know, it just reminded me of something from the past, and I was wondering, uh, does it make sense in the context of supplements and, you know, non-prescription medications in general to have some kind of a symbol that makes it very easy to communicate. You know, like back in the day, there was the radioactive symbol that would be put on a lot of things. It was a very clear indication that, you know, this is something that's dangerous. And, you know, to just highlight the fact that, yes, you're using it as a supplement, you're using it as something, you know, which is over the counter, but there are consequences. I will say, <clears throat> without naming, um the substance of being from the state of Colorado, um, and I'm not talking about mushrooms, uh, that being from the state of Colorado, exactly what you're saying on a particular product where people have now gone off and made things that look like candy or energy drinks or all sorts of things, by law now um, we got passed that you have to put a particular symbol that denotes what kind of substance it is so that when people go to take it, that they know exactly that, hey, just FYI, there is this particular substance here just in case you uh, didn't know that. And so I think, you know, we don't want to do too many symbols, I think, because then there's a confusion of that. But to your – yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I think, I think to you, you, you're making a good point. That it's another potential deterrent upstream to – you know, reduce the risk of somebody getting something that they didn't really want to or not knowing the risk of what they were taking or whatever it is. So it seems to have worked in, in Colorado to this point. I think that suggestion is going to have to be refined a little bit because the dose is the poison. Water in enough quantity will kill someone. Do we need labels on water? Um, I, I'm being facetious here, obviously, but um, but I think it, it's it's a little bit more complex than just sticking a logo and, and, and something like that. So. And I think I found one question I might have skipped over earlier. Um, focusing on the OTC drug product market, what are the most common drugs involved in poisonings? And I think we focused maybe on gummy earlier, but I guess OTC drugs overall most common in poisonings. So the non-steroidals? So the uh, ibuprofen products and the products, but mostly ibuprofen, and then acetaminophen. 
Um, we've seen quite a decrease in cough and cold preparations. Um, if you look at data from the year 2000 to 2007, 2008, there were quite a few pediatric exposures to cough and cold preparations, the multi-system, uh, multi-symptom cough and cold preparations. But they've gone down uh, tremendously, and we have plenty of data to show that. The reason they went down so much is because of the voluntary withdrawal based on an FDA recommendation, but the voluntary withdrawal of these cough and cold preparations for children under the age of four, you're going to have trouble right now going to a retail pharmacy and finding a cough and cold product for your one-year-old or two-year-old or whatever. They are no longer available, so they're not bought by parents. They're not found in the household. Children don't get into them, and therefore, we have less calls and less ED visits. Um, so cough and cold preparations used to be quite high up on the list, but no longer. So it's it's back to our over-the-counter non-steroidals or acetaminophen products, um, and then maybe our anti histamines. Um, and yes, diphenhydramine was mentioned, but there's a lot of loratadine, and, you know, the, the second generation antihistamine, so to speak, a lot of that uh, uh, being used in children as well. They have a lot of children formulations of these. So again, children get into those uh, as well. All right. Any other questions from the audience? That's all I have. Thank you all very much for your time, and thank you for the panel. I'll leave it up to Brandon to close this out. All right. Thanks again, Dr. Farwani, for moderating the session. Um, so again, I want to thank our panelists. Uh, amazing discussion. And, and now we'll close out the workshop with final remarks from Dr. Terry Michelle, again, Director of the Office of Non-Prescription Drugs here at FDA. All right, well, I think I have to start with just wow. Uh, this has been such a terrific workshop, just really excellent presentations. I've been so impressed, and I think the audience uh, will agree. I would like to once again thank all of our speakers, panelists, moderators for all of the terrific information that we heard, the opinions, um, just so much good stuff. I think all of you who were here in the room saw me taking copious notes, uh, and certainly we'll all be taking this back, and there will be lots of discussion on all of these topics here at FDA. So just reflecting back on what we heard, um, we heard from three very different panels. Uh, the first one was focused on manufacturing. The second one was focused on issues related to adherence. And the third was really focused on risks. So for panel one, uh, we appreciated the USP definition of a chewable gel dosage form for dietary supplements and about some of the manufacturing and stability issues that can come up with these dosage forms. We also heard about some of the tricks of the trade uh, that formulators use to mask the bitter tastes of drugs uh, and the feel of drugs. I mean, certainly all kinds of things about taste that I, I never even knew. Uh, and yet it all makes intuitive sense when you hear about it. Uh, and finally, we heard about some of the creative options that are becoming available, some of the newer technologies with 3D printing, all kinds of things we can do with individualized dosage forms uh, that can be particularly useful for particular patients and particular challenges in formulation. So this panel was very helpful in comparing some of the characteristics of candy with the characteristics of uh, a typical drug product. And we heard that candies generally have sweeter um, taste palates. They have stronger aromatic flavors, novel textures, novel forms, brighter colors, creative packaging, all kinds of things, and, and I, I hadn't really thought about it, but that color really does uh, make a difference in how you think about the flavor of something. So something to keep in mind. Then in panel two, we heard a little bit on the flip side. You know, 
some of the unique and rare circumstances where candy-like dosage forms are helpful to achieve a therapeutic intent. Uh, certainly the example from our dental colleagues was very useful. And some of the benefits of other creative dosage forms like uh, mini tabs and orally disintegrating tablets, as well as the benefits of maybe encouraging kids to be able to swallow tablets, uh, because that's, of course, the best taste masking is if it never really gets much in your mouth. An important takeaway that I took from all of these uh, examples that we heard was that they were all used in very controlled circumstances. Uh, under the direct supervision of a healthcare provider. And that's really just not the case in the OTC market. So when we start to think about where do these fit in, um, we're hearing some great examples from the prescription world and the direct supervision, um, but maybe less in the OTC space. Then in panel three, uh, we sort of focused on the risks. And we heard from some of our um, colleagues with poison control experience. Uh, we started off with a fantastic historical example of some of the unintended consequences that can happen when a dosage form tastes too good. I mean, I certainly grew up with the concept of a St. Joseph's aspirin, um, and I remember it was such a rare treat to get to take one. Uh, so something that we need to kind of keep in the back of our mind as we are exploring what's going on with these um, new and uh, more candy-like dosage formulations. The other thing that I think came through loud and clear from this panel is that children will get into anything, and children will especially get into anything that tastes like or looks like candy. They'll find a way. Um, kids are incredibly creative. I'm, I'm always amazed at the things that they do that we never would have thought of. Um, we heard about some of the things that we can do, some of the tools in our toolbox as regulators, as manufacturers, as formulators, to try to protect against some of these things uh, related to you know, child-resistant packaging, what an incredible benefit that has been for public health. Some of the newer flow restrictors and the, the unit dose packaging and how that has made a difference in certain circumstances. Um, but I think the perception also makes a huge difference in the market. You know, we heard that OTCs as a whole, and we've known this for a lot of years, are perceived by the general public to be less harmful or less risky than a prescription drug product. And then that gets multiplied uh, with some of these more candy-like dosage forms like gummies. So we have to think about that perception factor and how do we factor that in when we're thinking about these formulations. So again, um, thank you to our panelists, to our speakers. We'll be taking all this feedback back um, I can uh, hear the conversations already going on. There's going to be lots of them. And I uh, wish all of you a very uh, pleasant day, safe travels, and thanks again for joining us for this very important workshop.